were you gobsmacked by any of the cultural differences during your travels? I was, I was gobsmacked, especially in Argentina, when you would go to a, a restaurant at midnight and people would just be arriving with their kids, uh, whole families until 2 a.m., 3 a.m., eating and drinking. Um, because in the UK, restaurants are more or less closed by 10 p.m. Welcome to English with Lewis. Let's go. Hello, everybody, and welcome back once again to another conversation on my channel. I am Lewis, English with Lewis, and today I have a fantastic guest. So, um, welcome, uh, Frank, Francis. Yes, Frank. Well, Francis is on my passport, but everyone calls me Frank. So, yeah, Frank, or from Frankly Speaking English. A lot of people call me Frankly. That's not my name. Frank is my name. Frankly is the page. Perfect. And um, why did you come up with the name Frankly Speaking English? Well, I'm, people are probably aware of this, but Frank in English means honest. So to be frank is to be honest. So f we often say, for example, the phrase Frankly Speaking, which is like speaking honestly or getting to the point, being direct. And so it kind of worked as a pun, Frankly Speaking English, the good page name that fits in with my actual name. Uh -huh. Perfect. So yeah, uh, Frank or Francis, but never frankly. <laughs> never frankly and almost never Francis. Frank, let's say Frank. To make it simple, Frank. Perfect. Excellent. Well, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to have a chat. We're going to be speaking about different topics, uh, talking about your life, career and journey to becoming frankly speaking English and have a little bit of a chin wag, or we could also say a little bit of a natter on, which are two very nice British English ways of saying we're going to have a chit chat, a chat, a conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you could also say we're going to chew the fat. Oh, you ever use that one? <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's another one. I just just popped into my brain there. Perfect. To chew the fat, have a natter on, have a chin wag. So, um. <laughs> First things first, um, when you were growing up, uh, where did you grow up, by the way? So I grew up in London, in an area of West London called Richmond-upon-Thames. It's famous now because it's featured in the series Ted Lasso. Uh -huh. But um, before that, it was kind of famous for a lot of famous parks and botanical gardens. It's a very calm area of London. Not much happening, but okay. it's very pleasant. And uh, am I right in thinking that this is near the uh, rugby stadium, near Twickenham? Yes, it's near Twickenham Rugby Stadium. It's, uh, it, yes, yeah, about, it's a, in that kind of area. I'm trying to think of what other landmarks. There's Brentford Football Club, which is my football club that's also based in, in, uh, in that area of London. So that, for me, that's more important than the rugby stadium. But yeah, the National Rugby Stadium in Twickenham is, is around there. Uh -huh. It's just around the corner. It's maybe a stone's throw away, uh, yeah. but it's very, very close. And yeah. uh, as you can see, and as people will know, I'm definitely into my footy. I'm a big football fan and a big Leeds United fan. Um, but Brentford, uh, for those of you uh, who are watching this and are not familiar with the club, that I'm sure you are now they play in the Premier League, uh, it's been a bit of a whirlwind of success and the club has been revolutionized in the last like decade, hasn't it? Yeah, it's definitely been a whirlwind. When I was uh, younger, we used to go to the stadium and it was practically empty. It was about 3,000 people. I've been a season ticket holder for 26 years since I was a baby. Uh, it was about two or 3,000 people. We were playing in the English fourth division and uh, us in a very, very old, dilapidated stadium. And now we're in the Premier League. In the last 10 years, we went from the fourth division to the Premier League. And now we have a brand new stadium. We have famous players playing for England, a uh, full stadium. A lot of, a lot of fans uh, came out of the woodwork when uh -huh. we found success. Um, so yeah, it's been a whirlwind and now we're getting used to being a Premier League club. It's been a big change, but it's been really, really fun. Yeah, I bet. Like, it's weird because whilst uh, Leeds have just been going from bad to worse and uh, been hidden in the championship for so long, at the same time, 
Brentford have been rising like astronomically. Yeah. Uh, how's it happened? <laughs> well, we crossed paths. We crossed paths with Leeds quite a few times in League One. We had a title battle for with Leeds uh, in the Championship as well. So we've been uh, kind of Leeds have been on their downfall as we've been rising up. Uh, but we had some good. I remember when Leeds were in League One. It was like, wow, we're playing a really big team. Like this is Leeds United. We're actually playing Leeds United in in League One. That was like a big, big thing for us uh, because Leeds are historically one of the best teams in the country, or one of the most famous, one of the bigger clubs. They had a lot of success in the, I think, in the nineties and the eighties, maybe early two thousands. I think in the sixties, seventies, we had yeah. like a, a golden era and won titles maybe. and stuff like that. And then the year I was born, uh, nineteen ninety two, we won the. English first division the year before it became the Premier League. So uh, maybe I brought good luck. I'm not sure. Or maybe I was a curse. And <laughs> yeah, it sounds then, like you were the curse, actually. Downhill. <laughs> <laughs> sounds right. like you were the curse, actually. <laughs> yeah, so they haven't won anything since you were born. Uh, well, uh, we did win during the pandemic the champions uh, championship, and uh, we ah, got promoted having won the championship with Marcelo Bielsa. And uh, he changed everything completely. And for me, he's one of the best managers that has ever existed. Um, but yeah, we didn't stay in the Premier League for very long. And yeah. this season, we uh, lost in the playoff final. Uh, but I believe that uh, this year, Leeds are going to get promoted again. Yeah. Fingers crossed. We had we had that playoff final defeat with Brentford as well. A couple of times, it's gutting when it happens. Yeah, it's horrible. But um, moving on from football now, um, I'm English, of course. I'm from Leeds, but I don't really know London that well. And uh, what are the best things to do if you're visiting London that are not the most tourist trap options? Uh, what would you do? What would you recommend that I do for a weekend <laughs> away in London? So, I mean, you've got to do some of the tourist things. There's some that I definitely don't recommend. The London Eye, for example, I think it's not really worth it. It's a bit of a tourist trap. But um, and I, I've actually, uh, there's a few tourist things I've never done because as a local, you just never get round to doing them. Uh, whenever people visit me in London and I have to show them around, the first thing I recommend is getting a bike. It's really easy to cycle around London. There's a lot of bike highways. You can see everything. It's a really nice way to see the city. Uh -huh. um, going to a local pub uh, and watching a football game or watching some live music, that's something that's very British. And in London, there's pubs, beautiful old pubs everywhere, 300 years old, 200 years old. Um, uh, just, I think just wandering around and getting lost, that's probably the best thing you can do in London. It's a huge city and you, everything is interesting. There's beautiful areas everywhere. So just walk around, get lost, and uh, you'll find something that no one else has seen before. Okay, perfect. Good little tips. And uh, many people are afraid of visiting London because they think that it's going to be ridiculously expensive. Um, I haven't been to London since before the pandemic. Like... How expensive is it nowadays to go and, I don't know, have fish and chips or go for a pint in a pub? Uh, well, it's expensive. There's no way around it. It is expensive. But um, if you want to get a pint of a pint of lager, a pint in a pub, you're, you're going to have to pay through the nose. Pay about probably anything less than seven pounds is a bargain. So that's something that you have to get used to. But on the other hand, you can do London very cheap. If you want to, there's really no need to spend a lot of money. All the museums are free. Um, you can get a bike that's not very expensive. You can get public transport. It's, ex it's expensive in comparison to other cities, but it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you can get the supermarkets are quite cheap and you can get good food, meal deals. Um, you know, walking around the city, going to the parks is all free. So for me, when I'm in London, I don't spend a lot of money. I know where to go. I know which places have a great atmosphere that you don't need to pay a lot to get into or it's free to get in. Um, so it's really not necessary to, 
to go bankrupt. You can spend as much as you want or as little as you want. Okay. So important to know that London is possible to do on a budget and used a nice expression, which was to pay through the nose. If mm -hmm. you pay through the nose, uh, it's you're paying a lot of money. It costs you a fortune. It costs you an arm and a leg. And uh, going back earlier, you used a nice phrasal verb. I love phrasal verbs. And it was to get round to doing something. As mm -hmm. a Londoner, uh, born and bred, sometimes you don't get round to doing all of the touristy things, meaning that you don't have time to do these things. I sometimes don't get round to, I don't know, cleaning the house, for example. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All of these things, it's like something that you should do that is a good idea, but you just, it's not one of your priorities. So you just haven't got round to doing it. That implies that in the future, you still might do it, but until now you haven't had the time or the motivation to do it. So I think you often find that locals don't often get round to doing the most touristy things in their city. Um, when I was living in Rio de Janeiro, for example, we will get onto that, but there were a lot of locals who never got round to going to Christ the Redeemer, for example. But if you're a tourist for a weekend, you would definitely go. Exactly. You just always keep putting it off. You keep pushing it back and leaving it for later. Um, before we get on to the different places where you lived and stuff like this, um, when you were growing up, um, what did you want to do? What did you want to be? Was it ever clear for you? My first memory of a job that I really wanted to do was owning a sweet shop because okay. I was a kid and I thought that would be the dream job because you'd have access to as many sweets as you want to eat at any time. Unlimited Haribo. Unlimited Haribo. So I just thought that that's got to be the dream job. I don't understand why every adult is not doing that. Um, then I had the classic ones, a footballer, rock star. Um, I never had a clear, a realistic idea of what I wanted to do. That's part of the reason that, uh, you know, after university, after I graduated, I I didn't go straight into London to start a traditional career mm -hmm. because I didn't really have a strong idea of what, what, it, what it was I wanted to do. So I put it off. I put it off a little bit. Awesome. And uh, at university, at uni, what did you study in the end? I studied something that I was really interested in, but not specifically interested in making a career out of, which was human geography and international development. Okay. So I was always really interested in other countries, how other countries develop and why there's big inequality in different cities and all of that kind of stuff. So I chose this subject, human geography, which is all about immigration, emigration, push and pull factors, different societies, how societies and cities are formed around the world. Um, so that kind of stuff really interested me. So I, I went for that. And uh, but I was not really with a career in mind, more of just to learn about it and leave it at that. Okay. And was this in London as well? Or did you move out and go to a different city? I went to Norwich. So I went to University of East Anglia, which is in Norwich, in Norfolk, mm -hmm. which is kind of if you look at the map of England, it's kind of in the bulge opposite Wales. Um, it's a nice place, very historic town, very his well city. It's a city. Um, I think I think the motto of the city is it's it's a fine place, okay. which kind of sums it up. It's not okay. too much. It's not too little. It's it's really nice, really it's old. Just right. It's just right. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> they didn't try and oversell themselves. So uh, yeah, it's nice, like very old cobbledy streets, little shops and very nice pubs. And I think that it has the highest pubs and churches per capita in the UK. So uh, if you're never short of pubs or churches. Okay. Well, uh, in that case, if you like pubs and churches, you should definitely visit Seville because yep. in Spain, I think it has the same record where uh, per capita or per square meter, it has the most uh, churches, cathedrals, etc., and bars. Uh, so yeah, check there it out. There must be some kind of correlation between bars and churches that someone that has a lot of churches also has a lot of bars. Exactly. If you're preparing for mass or for a procession or whatever, yeah. and then after you're like, oh, shall we, shall we have a quick <laughs> one? You know, fancy a pint? 
<laughs> Fancy a pint, exactly. Awesome. So uh, anyway, you did this at university. And then when you graduated, you went to Argentina, to Buenos Aires. Um, why? <laughs> yeah, why? That's the question I've been asked. <laughs> <laughs> I I've been asked this question por qué por qué Argentina? Uh I've been asked that question hundreds of times. My answer is always the same. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't got a clue. Um I chose Argentina because it was far away and I didn't know anything about it and for me that was kind of my requisite for what I was looking for in a place somewhere that was really far away that I didn't know anyone. And I didn't know anything about uh -huh. because I, I kind of wanted an adventure, I guess. I didn't want to be too, I didn't want to go somewhere that was too familiar or where I was going to bump into a lot of people that I knew. I also thought Spanish probably a manageable language for me to learn. I wasn't really prepared for the Argentinian accent. Uh -huh. And uh, what else? The food. Another big pull factor was uh, I had a kind of idea of what they eat in Argentina. And I'm a very fussy person when it comes to food. So I knew I, <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to be able to survive. Basically, steak, uh, ice cream, beer, wine. It just sounded perfect. <laughs> Barbecue. Right. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I mentioned this before we started recording as well. And maybe people don't know this about me. Maybe you do. But when I was at university studying languages, I chose to spend six months in Argentina. And uh, I didn't choose the exact location where I did it because it was with a company that was called something like Colonias de Mersion, which is like immersion colonies. And they assigned me a family and a school where I'd go and live there and work there for six months. And uh, it was in Bahia Blanca, which is in the south of the province of Buenos Aires. But uh, Argentina is a very, very big place. Uh, so... Even if it's in the same province, it was like six hours by bus. Um, so it was like, it was miles away. Um, and I had a lot of similar thoughts when I was choosing to go there. That uh, maybe not because of the food, because I'm quite open and not very fussy with food. But I was thinking uh, lots of Spanish Italian people or that descent, which uh, I like Italy, I like Spain. So <laughs> the perfect blend. <laughs> You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. And I was thinking the food must be good because it's famous for its steak. But then mm -hmm. because of these Spanish and Italian people, then they'll also have a lot of Italian food and Spanish food, which kind of is the case. And not going to lie, I also thought Argentinian women would be beautiful. And this was a pull factor. And <laughs> it's also true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's definitely true the people are very friendly very beautiful good looking people and uh but very friendly and i uh, i loved argentina from the first moments i was there especially in buenos aires i never went to uh Bahia blanca because it's quite far away <laughs> yeah it's i know of it uh, you can get a direct train there from from buenos aires but it's far away so it's very interesting to go so basically the middle of nowhere in Argentina. It is on the coast, so I'm sure you had some nice beaches or something. Yeah, you could, they had some beaches in the city. You didn't really have a beach, but then everybody went to a place which was called Monte Hermoso, and mm -hmm. it was like half an hour's drive, more or less, and this was more of a beach resort town where people had their second residences, and then in summer they'd usually go there for, I don't know, a month, two months, and just live life and enjoy themselves really um yeah, yeah i had a great time in argentina i haven't been back there since and it's been like 10 years now but i'd love to uh, but i'm wondering did argentina live up to your expectations was it kind of what you expected it to be like so the good thing about my argentina story is that i had no expectations from when i got there i literally did almost no research um, on Argentina and Buenos Aires and what it was like. I was really surprised when I got there and, uh, you know, it was all, it looked like Paris. It was very safe, very clean, very cool. Um, it was, you know, I was kind of expecting it to be really different, um, but actually it was 
kind of um, had a lot of similarities with a lot of European cities. Mm-hmm. Um, it lived up to my expectations. Yeah, well, I, I guess what I really expected was there to be a lot of uh, passion of people, a lot of noise, a lot of music, a lot of good food, a lot of energy, and it definitely lived up to those expectations. I'm a big football fan, so the first day I arrived was the Super Classico between Boca and River. Uh-huh. All the fans in the streets, and yeah, I think that definitely lived up to my expectations. I guess I could say it surpassed my expectations in terms of how uh, you know nice everything was around the city, and um, yeah, it was really I was really uh, taken aback by how every restaurant, every cafe, every bar was just beautiful. Like uh, if it was in London, it would be one of the coolest places in London. But every the standard bar there was like that. Uh huh. Perfect. It sounds like you loved it. You fell in love with Argentina, and uh, of course, it's normal to do this. And you mentioned football. Uh, the two big teams are Boca and River. Um, I chose to support Boca Juniors, uh, partly because of the family, but also because of the colors of the shirt. It's kind of like Leeds's colors. Um, yeah. You too, you say? Yeah, yeah. I also went for Boca. Um, I guess in in Buenos Aires, the story of the two teams is that uh, River is kind of the millionaires they call them, uh-huh. um, and Boca was more of the the working class team uh, from the working class neighbor, and River is from the richest neighborhood. The first place I lived was quite near River Stadium, but most of the people I made friends with were Boca fans, and uh, the stadium is more iconic with this kind of very unique stadium. The fans are a little bit crazier, so I was always more drawn towards it, and and I ended up going to quite a few games, getting uh, regular tickets to go. So yeah, I, I was fully. By the time I left, I was fully Boca. Awesome. This is one of my regrets that I didn't manage to go to any of the matches, and I really wanted to go to uh, the Bombonera uh, to see what it's like because I've seen images of like pre-match, post-match, during the match where. Literally, the stands are shaking because mm-hmm. people are like moving up and down and chanting all of the time. Like, what was the atmosphere like for the big matches? Well, it was buzzing. It was electric. Um, the before the game, there's the bands, the people in the street drinking. During the game, it's nonstop singing. There's quite a big difference between football culture in the UK and football culture in. Um, Latin America in general mm-hmm. is that the crowds in the UK, the atmosphere is really following the game. So in the UK, so when the game is exciting, the the crowd is excited and singing. When the game is boring, the crowd dies down. When you're yeah. losing, you're not really singing that much, and when you're winning, everyone's singing. In Argentina, it's kind of the opposite. The crowd sets the mood, so the crowd is always singing, no matter whether you're losing, whether the game is boring, no matter what's happening in the game. The crowd is always singing, always going crazy. There's no big reaction when the difference between, you know, if you're five nil up or five nil down, there's no big reaction when there's a goal, a big change. It's kind of just constant noise, constant singing, chanting. So that part is is really amazing. The good thing about that is that no matter when you go, you know the atmosphere is going to be good, no matter the result. So yeah, it was um, it was an unforgettable experience. Okay, perfect. And I guess you needed to immerse yourself. And to do this, you need to learn the language, or at least this is a way of improving your Spanish. If you're going to matches and you have friends who do this as well, you said that before you went there, you thought that Spanish might be quite manageable. You'd be able to learn it. Mm-hmm. So, um, did you learn it? And if so, how did you do it? So I learned. So this really started my language interest in language learning because at school i just couldn't learn languages i did german for five years i can't say a real sentence in german i definitely can't hold a conversation i can maybe get past two or three uh, seconds of speaking Uh i also did french as every english person probably does at least a year of french or two years of french i'm not sure it depends on the school but um in my school it was mandatory to learn two years of French. Definitely can't speak any French, can say my name, nothing else. 
So I really thought languages is just something that's beyond me. I just can't do this. In England as well, there's not a lot of people that speak a second language. It's definitely not a lot of people that speak it fluently. Mm -hmm. um, I'm out of all my friends, my friendship group, I'm the only person who can really speak a second language. So there's not really a culture of learning a languages. Um, so I kind of put it off. And then when I thought, do you know what? I, 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 the only way I'm going to be able to do this is if I have no choice. So I went to Argentina. I didn't have anyone. I didn't speak any Spanish and I didn't know anyone who spoke English. So the first step I did to, to learn was, well, I did the obvious things, which was a bit of Duolingo, watching some YouTube videos. Uh, something that really helped me get a grip of the language was listening to music. So I went on the Argent classic Argentinian songs, the most popular Argentinian songs. Mm -hmm. I made a playlist and I started adding songs that I was hearing on the radio, etc., to this playlist. And I would literally learn the lyrics off by heart. To this point, five years later, I can still sing all of these old Argentinian rock songs word for word in Spanish. Because I just, before I even knew what the words meant, I learned them off by heart. And uh, I knew the lyrics in Spanish. And then I would learn what they mean in English. Mm -hmm. And this gave me such a good base for vocabulary, pronunciation, sentence structure, different phrases. And the most important thing that I think that a lot of language learners miss when they're learning a language is connecting with the culture of the country that you're actually learning the language for. So the big difference for me was when I knew these songs, I would go to a lot of Argentinian parties or to an asado, like a traditional barbecue in Argentina. And I would kind of be the, the foreigner, uh, would definitely be standing out and kind of the people would be- The center of attention. Uh, yes, the center of attention, but also someone that people were kind of, they, they kind of treat you like you're not really, you're maybe a tourist or you're not really, you don't really know a lot about Argentina because uh -huh. a lot of people pass through for a week or so. And so you're the center of attention in a way, but you're also, you, if you're trying to immerse yourself in the language, you, you want to kind of fit in because you want people to start speaking to you and inviting you to places that maybe a tourist wouldn't be so comfortable. And so what would happen is that a, a song would come on, I would maybe sing along a little bit and that little bit saying a couple words from the song, people would be like, what, <laughs> how on earth do you know the lyrics to this rock song from the 70s from Argentina. Uh -huh. And they started to treat me really differently, they started to treat me like, oh, this guy's, you know, he's, he's here for the, you know, he's, he's in it for the long term, he's, you know, some, they started to treat you less like a tourist. And also just, you're just able to connect with people. And so that really helped me not just in a language way, but also just fit in and get myself into more situations where I was just immersed in the language and, um, and also help me connect with local people. So I always try and get my students to learn songs, learn lyrics, and it really helped me with my pronunciation, being able to speak quickly because I could sing along to all these songs at a really fast pace. So I got used to moving my mouth in the right way that becoming natural to connect all these words together. Uh -huh. So that was it. Apart from that, it was just months and months and months of repeating the same lines, having hearing the same thing over and over again, eventually learning pieces of vocabulary bit by bit until you get to like a basic conversation. And after that, it, you know, it goes up exponentially because after you can speak a little bit, you start to learn very quickly all the bits that you didn't know before. Ah, it's interesting. It's nice to hear that uh, you did kind of dive into the world mm. of Argentina and the Spanish as well, because the Spanish from Argentina is quite a lot different to the Spanish from Colombia and Mexico and Spain, etc. And after my time in Argentina, I was speaking as if I was Argentinian, of course, without perfect Spanish, but my accent sounded a lot more Argentinian than uh, Spanish from Spain. I was using words which were very, very Argentina. I was like, "What's up, boludo? Yeah, what's up, Which is uh, yeah, basically yeah. me using a few little phrases that show that I know uh, Argentinian Spanish. But then, exactly. since then, my Spanish has become much more Spanish from Spain. Yeah, and 
this only happens when you are speaking to people, you're going places, you're being invited to places. Mm -hmm. Usually the biggest mistake that people make when going to another country to improve their English, for example, is that they don't, you know, go out of their comfort zone and try to meet people who speak the language that they're trying to improve. And they mm -hmm. just stick to the easy option of speaking. Yeah. For example, let's say you are Brazilian and you're living in Dublin and you always go out uh, with your Brazilian friends, then this is going to really hold you back. Mm -hmm. It's going to prevent you from making these improvements that you want to make in your English. And uh, just one more thing related to music. I don't know if you know the application mm -hmm. and the website, but uh, Lyrics Training. Uh, mm -hmm. Lyrics Training is an incredible website and the app is called Lingo Clip. And basically what it does is you can search any song in any language, basically. And then with that, you can uh, watch the YouTube video. And at the same time, you're given like uh, the lyrics and options oh, nice. to be able to fill in the gaps. So it's awesome. an interactive application. Lingo Clip is the name or the website is Lyrics Training. And even if you don't know any of the words, you can just kind of press on that word and then it'll give you the translation in your mother tongue. So it's an absolute game changer. I'd recommend everybody gives it a go. I'm not being uh, sponsored to say this. Uh, <laughs> you should be. I should, yeah. It, it's free as well. So it's free. Uh, at, lyrics at training. Certain point. Lyrics training and lingo clip. You can use the free version and it'll give you more than enough to improve whatever language you're studying, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm definitely going to try that out because I, I also have a series on my Instagram where I post songs and I post the lyrics and I highlight key phrases and explain them from whatever famous English songs. But uh, yeah, I really uh, relate to what you're saying because a lot of people move abroad, they move to the UK, they move to Ireland and they just think that they're going to be speaking English all the time. Both of these places are really international, so a lot of people underestimate how much work and effort you have to put in to actually push yourself into situations to meet local people, speak English. Um, there's a lot of ways. If you're in a big city, there's always a language exchange meetup that, uh, like Mundolingo is a big one, um, that they do it in a lot of different cities where you can go a couple nights a week and talk to people in different languages and it's a very good way to meet local people. But yeah, a lot of people get comfortable. They find it easy. I met a few people in Argentina who had been living there for six years, Brit Brits who didn't learn Spanish and were, you know, getting by just speaking English with English speaking people. So yeah. I mean, it's always possible. It's the lazy option and fair enough if it's not a priority. But if it is a priority to improve the language that you're trying to study, then you have to go out your comfort zone and choose the hard option to immerse yourself with a group of people who are going to be patient and help you with your uh, English learning journey, let's say. But um, music, uh, I'm not very good when it comes to music. Um, <laughs> I like listening to music, of course, everybody does. But I'm terrible at remembering the lyrics. I never really go to any gigs or live concerts. I like there to be live music on in a pub. But to be honest, I'm not that fussed. Um, have you always been interested in music? And do you play any uh, musical instruments? So, uh, well, yes, that's true. Maybe that did inform my decision to use music because I've always been a kind of music geek. My dad is a huge music fan. He goes to gigs three or four times a week in London. So I was grew up constantly going to gigs, going to rock gigs and and uh, and well, all types of music actually. And so always and always being like a big fan of certain bands. So yeah, music, being a listener has always been a, a big part of. And I, I also ran a radio station at university playing music. Okay. That was focused on Britpop, um, 90s British music. Britpop, for those who don't know, is the period from the 90s. It's basically the 90s, and it was Oasis, Blur, uh, Pulp, The Verve, and a, a few other bands that were very British. That was kind of the whole style, was to be as British as possible. Um, just for this about seven or eight years in the 90s. 
and it was called Britpop. So I did a radio station for Britpop at university. Um, in terms of playing, I'm I'm a kind of the black sheep of my family because uh, all of my brothers, I've got three brothers, I'm one of four. Uh, they're all musicians, and they all are full time working in music and okay. playing and performing in London. And I'm an English teacher traveling around the world. So I'm kind of the black sheep. Both of my parents also were very good musicians um, with the piano, the guitar. Um, and my brothers are jazz musicians and classical musicians. So um, in that case, no, I don't. I, I play the ukulele as uh -huh. a hobby, but I'm not a musician. So it runs in the family, but you are the odd one out, the black yeah. sheep. <laughs> yes, exactly. It runs in the family, but I'm definitely the odd one out, the black sheep. And if you could choose to start learning a new musical instrument right now, which one would you choose? I think the guitar, because I'm not going to be too ambitious. I've seen the amount of work that my brothers put into perfecting the trumpet and the the saxophone. And I feel like um, with the guitar, it's kind of manageable. Maybe you're not going to be the best, but you can probably get up to a point where you can play something that's quite, you know, listenable. <laughs> So uh, I think I, I, I already play the ukulele. I'm getting a feel for it. Uh, I've started about a year ago. So I think the next step would be, would be the guitar and uh, just as a hobby. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. Now, uh, going back to uh, traveling and living abroad after Argentina, um, you mentioned that you were in Brazil and Turkey. So just yeah. sum up your experience in both countries. Let's start with Brazil. So in Brazil, in uh, it was uh, that was my next big adventure. So I came back from Argentina. Um, I stayed in the UK for a few months because at that time it was just the end of the pandemic and travel restrictions. I went to Brazil the first day that they opened the borders from the UK. I arrived. Um, actually, I arrived two days before they opened the border from Brazil because I went to Portugal for two weeks to because you had to be out of the UK for 10 days before Brazil would let you in. Okay. Um, so I actually arrived. It wasn't necessary in the end because they opened the border this, around the same time I arrived. Um, so I went to Brazil. I straight away was doing the same thing I did in Argentina, learning Brazilian music. It was more fun in Brazil because the music is so good and it's so fun to listen to. So um, I immersed myself that way. I, I already had a blueprint for the way that I was going to immerse myself in the culture because I'd already done it in Argentina. I'd done it the hard way. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot. I moved to Rio and uh, how would I sum up my time in Rio? So I was there for about seven or eight months the first time. And um, I it was a mixed bag. The, especially the first three months, I was kind of, uh, I was definitely way out of my comfort zone. I was a little bit intimidated by Rio as a city um, because I, I had got used to Buenos Aires and the, I kind of the relative uh, safety and security that it has, the, how clean it is, how, how, uh, how nice it is, how posh it is, like it was all uh, lovely parks and, and everything uh, was just really beautiful. Rio as a city it's completely different. So it was, um, it's a stunning place, stunning setting and the city, the architecture is all really nice as well. Mm -hmm. But it was definitely a different vibe, a vibe that uh, at night you couldn't really walk around. It wasn't a city where you'd say, oh, let's walk for a couple of hours and explore without a plan. Uh, a lot of people around me were telling me stories of uh, crime and getting robbed and you never really felt 100% safe. And the first couple of months I thought, you know, I just don't like this. Um, but it was a mixed bag because after six or seven months, I, I thought it was the best city in the world. And even now, I, it's definitely my favorite city in the world, Rio. I, I got what, what changed then? I think what changed is that I, got, I just got to know people. I got to know the right people. I got to know locals. I moved away from the kind of touristy areas. I moved into the... Um, into more of a local neighborhood. I made friends with a lot of, I, I moved into a big house, a shared house, like a co-living with, I was the only foreigner, it was all Brazilians. Mm -hmm. um, 
it was a really nice area of Rio. I just got to know a lot of local people. I got into the music scene. I started to learn where to go and what are the places that really suited me. Um, I got more comfortable with, okay, where's not, where's not a great area to walk around? Where is a good area? And, and then I started to really enjoy the city and, and it's an incredible city. It's just nonstop action. It's music, um, dancing, sun, rainforest, beaches, wildlife. It has literally everything. And, and also I'm quite an active person. So a lot of football, beach football, beach volleyball, um, cycling, running, amazing locations for everything. You go for a cycle ride and you literally could be the most beautiful place in, on earth. Uh -huh. So by the end of it, I just was completely in the on the, in the rhythm of the city and I can't recommend it enough. I think it's the best place, the best city to visit. It just has unlimited options to okay. things to do. Perfect. So um, yeah. why did you leave? I left, well, there was some visa complications. <laughs> I oh, have, uh, yeah. <laughs> so as a British citizen, I only get six, I only got six months in, in Brazil to stay legally. After that, I would have had to make a decision to get a, a visa, a proper visa. Um, I was also exhausted. It was, it's a full time, nonstop life living in Rio. I think anyone who's lived there or has been there will, will tell you that there's literally never a moment of any day where there's not something happening, something to do. I was finding it quite difficult to focus on work and my career. I, I was starting uh, in Brazil is when I, where I started my Instagram page. Um, actually, it didn't get really big until I left, but um, I was just uh, struggling to really keep my life on track, basically. So I went back to the UK. Um, I went back to Argentina, actually, for a few months, and then I went to the UK. And then I decided, well, I, wanna, I, I know that the next place I want to be is, is in Brazil and Argentina again. And, uh, but I want to spend one more Christmas in the UK. And so I've got three months or something until Christmas. So I don't want to stay in the UK, but I don't want to do a big travel to somewhere else, the other side of the world. So I thought I'll go to Turkey because that's something that's quite different, but quite close. Yeah. And so, and I've always wanted to go. I've never been. And Istanbul, I like the idea of huge cities. So Istanbul was really cooling for me. So I went to Istanbul, spent three months there. I think it's a great city. Loved it. I couldn't master Turkish. It was just... Uh, it I was mean, more it's a level difficult. up on like uh, Spanish, yeah. French, uh, Italian, Portuguese, because it has kind of nothing to do with English. There's no real connection Literally. there. Literally not a single word that you can understand if you're from English, not a single grammar rule, nothing. Um, that's another big thing that helped me with uh, Brazil is that after a couple of months, my Portuguese came, became pretty proficient. So that also really helped me enjoy the place a lot more. Um, Turkey, I just wasn't there long enough to really say for me, I've got like a three month rule. I can't really say I like or dislike a place until I've been there for at least three months. And Turkey, I just left when I was starting to enjoy it. <laughs> just when I was starting to find the, the places where I thought, oh, this is the kind of place that I, you know, I really like. And uh, it takes a few months to find those, those hidden gems. So I would definitely go back to Istanbul. Mm -hmm. But it's an amazing, beautiful city, loved it. But I didn't stay long enough to to really get into the swing of it. Okay, interesting. Well, we will see. Maybe your next location will be Istanbul, or who knows? Who knows? Maybe it'll be somewhere completely different, the other corner of the world. Uh, watch this space. Um, yeah. But anyway, before we finish off for today, let's just study and teach a couple of British English slang words, but in conversation, through conversation. Uh, we've used already the phrase uh, chinwag and nataron, which is like a chat. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a nice expression, and it is to be in a pickle. Uh, no, if you are that. in a pickle, you are in a, a difficult situation. Uh, and pickles, by the way, I'm sure people know, are the, um, how do I say it? pickled cucumbers basically where they're put in vinegar and left to uh, yeah. pickle <laughs> pickle yeah it's weird because they're called pickles but there's also the verb which is to pickle or pickled something so pickles are actually i don't know what are they they are pickled cucumbers 
aren't they? Usually, I mean, there are different types of pickles. You can pickle anything. You can pickle, I don't know, mm -hmm. um, onions. Uh, yeah, this conversation that's... was going so smoothly until I started <laughs> talking about pickles. And that... <laughs> well, <laughs> if you have a if mad. you if you have a burger, the little green things are pickles. And it's weird because in British English, we call these generally speaking gherkins. Like that's true, yeah. When you go to McDonald's, I remember uh, for fussy eaters, for picky eaters, usually they'd open the Big Mac mm. and then be like, "Oh, does anyone want my gherkins?" Yeah, yeah. But now you can pickles? take them off on you can take them off on the touch screen. I'm a fussy eater, so I know. You know this too well. But um, anyway, to be in a pickle is to be in a tricky situation, a difficult situation. So during your travels, have you ever been in a pickle? I've been in so many pickles. Um, I in I was in a big pickle in Turkey in Istanbul's airport because I lost my passports literally at the check-in desk. Ouch. I put it in a I put it in a machine, a check-in machine, and I just turned around without taking out. I turned back around five seconds, and it was gone. Um, so I checked in for the flight, but I didn't have my passport, so I missed my flights. Took me hours. I did eventually find it, and they put me on the next flight. But that was a big pickle. Um, I've been in mini pickles. So many God, pickles. the list the list is never ending. <laughs> And uh, let's do one more adjective, very British, which is gobsmacked. Mm -hmm. If you are gobsmacked, you're, you're shocked, you're really, really surprised. Uh, maybe you might see that your jaw will drop. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, were you gobsmacked by any of the cultural differences during your travels? I was, I was gobsmacked, especially in Argentina, when you would go to a, a restaurant at midnight and people would just be arriving with their kids, uh, whole families until 2 a.m., 3 a.m. eating and drinking. Um, because in the UK, restaurants are more or less closed by 10 p.m. They're definitely not serving food anymore. So in Argentina, when I, when I saw how late people eat, I, I was gobsmacked. Mental, crazy. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Awesome. Anyway, um, we'll finish there. I hope everybody you enjoyed this conversation and you were able to uh, find out a lot more about Frank, about uh, London, about Argentina, Brazil, and so much more. Of course, we've been using so many phrasal verbs and idioms during this conversation. So if you have any questions or you'd like me to clarify any of these meanings, please don't hesitate to leave a comment and I'd be more than happy to help. And uh, yeah, thank you for making it this far. And Frank, thank you for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed the chat, the chin wag. The chin wag, love it. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, everybody. And see you next time. Bye bye. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and see you next time. <laughs>